All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Beer Central survivors. Um, I've heard there's been a lot of parties, different parties going on yesterday. Um, I'd like to talk about um, a topic that's very like dear to my heart. Actually, um, I've always been like interested in the in the bridge between like frameworks and architecture. Although the latter is supposed not to actually um, include any frameworks in the first place, at least its definition. But when the rubber hits the road, we essentially have to get things implemented in a certain way. And um, then oftentimes the question comes up, does a certain framework that we want to use, that we need to use, uh, whatever, whatever way it actually makes it um, on, onto our radar, uh, actually helps us achieving something or basically sometimes even gets in the way. And um, yeah, I'd like to talk about like, the, 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 uh, a way or an idea how to actually improve monolithic application to be more modular, to stay more modular, and to actually make them more manageable in a way um, that I share some details with, with you uh, on. Um, my name is Oliver Drutboom. I'm uh, working for a company called Pivotal. Has anyone heard of Pivotal before? Uh, company behind the Spring Framework. I'm uh, the Spring Data Project Lead. Um, and as I said, around that, sort of interested in working on uh, prototyping uh, solutions to sort of help people implement uh, different kinds of architectures with the Spring Framework. And there has been a, um, a pretty um, strong, I'm not, don't want to say hype, but a strong tendency towards recommending microservice architectures these days, right? So you can't, pretty much can't attend a software conference that um, does not talk about that these days. And um, there are multiple reasons why people actually move to that kind of architecture. And for some of the reasons I was wondering, wait a second, um, if that's the reason you, I mean, does that really need to be a reason that you actually choose a particular architecture? Because every architectural style comes with certain uh, positive effects and certain downsides. And maybe there's a way to achieve the thing you want to achieve with, let's say, the more simple or the, uh, the um, easier way of just building, staying with your monolith that you maybe have experience in building the last couple of days. Who of you has attended uh, Axel uh, Fontaine's talk yesterday on the Majestic Modular Monolith? That's not too many, uh, like, what is it, 15% maybe? Um, he actually gave a very, I mean, if you, if you haven't attended, uh, please go ahead and uh, watch the talk, because he gives a lot of the, the rationale why you would want to uh, rather stay monolithic in the first place. There's a, there, it's, not, it's not a... Um, a uh, black or white scenario here, right? There's no, there's no, um, there's no. Okay, we either do that or we or we do that. It's more of a. There's certain shades of gray basically that you can that you can uh, choose from, and depending on what kind of context and organizational context, technical scenario you're in, you might want to choose one or the other. What I want to do is, if you have decided that you'd rather stay monolithic, and I'm I'm going to go into detail what I mean with monolithic in the first place. What means do you have um, to uh, to actually uh, keep control over the structure of that monolith in in a Spring Boot application? That's what I'm kind of assuming, or a Spring Framework application would work as well. Um, and I'm trying to start with a bit of context where we're coming from, what kind of aspects I want to focus on. So just um, I don't want to give a detailed like comparison between monolithic applications and microservices in the first place. Just a, a couple of pieces that will be interesting to the context of this talk, right? So we have uh, bounded contexts in green, deployment units in dark blue, internal invocations in white, and external invocations in light blue. Um, the monolithic approach basically assumes that you have some kind of structure, some kind of module, and I'm going to use bounded context and module interchangeably in this talk, and we wrap the deployment unit around that. It doesn't actually necessarily matter how many modules there are in there internally. Um, and that's basically where, that, where they, those shades of gray come in, right? Building a, a microservice, what, what does building microservices mean? For some people that means like every tiny bit is like a new service, so you end up with 50 or hundreds of microservices. Um, it could also mean that you just 
split up your previously monolithic system into, let's say, four or five coarse grained chunks, four or five coarse grained uh, deployment units, but keep like three or four modules internally in there. So um, it's actually kind of a neat model to, to get to, to not to oversplit the system in the first place, because that means that between the modules that, you that are contained in that, you can still have local, uh, local method calls to actually invoke um, other parts of the system, which is cheap, which is reliable, which is uh, guaranteed to be in exactly one delivery. Uh, so it, it simplifies the, um, the scenario quite a bit in the first place, if you can keep things together. Well, I'm going to, to list a couple of uh, more structured um, pros and cons of that in a second. The fundamentally different idea is that we, of microservices, is that we make the bounded context boundaries also the deployment boundaries. So there's some, some kind of correlation between the two, and then we actually have some form either by direct invocation through some HTTP mechanism or RPC or what have you, or uh, even uh, message driven, right? So in it with, a, with a broker. That doesn't really matter because it actually involves uh, sending messages or invoking stuff over the network into another process. It doesn't have to be another network, but anyway. So for the uh, monolith, so the, as I said, the um, fundamental idea in the context of this talk is we have multiple bounded contexts and a single deployment unit. And that actually means it's kind of easy to refactor in terms of easy. What, what do I mean with that? It's easy to change the, the structure of the, mod, uh, the modules, right? So if you find out that a piece of functionality doesn't belong into one module, it's, it's better placed in another, you can just use your IDE features to move that over. And it's also pretty easy to test the overall system. So if you have a Spring Boot application, all you need to do is just create a test case, say add Spring Boot test, and then just bootstrap the entire thing and um, then just like write your just standard Java code to interact with it. You have uh, just local assertions, local invocations. You can use the transaction rollback support in Spring Boot that automatically rolls back transactions for every test method. So it's kind of neat and um, pretty fast to run and it's uh, pretty cheap to set up basically. However, on the downside, it's quite likely to degrade, right? Unless you're actually um, uh, deploying some kind of means to manage the structure. So to initially define it and then through the life, uh, lifetime of the project actually find out about violations you might have introduced. And there are certain, so there's quite a, a variety of means that you can do to achieve that and they all have like, all again, uh, certain pros and cons on that and we will, we will actually see um, a new one in uh, in this talk and later on how that how that actually can work. Uh, what's a bit harder or what's rarely very rarely uh, tried is to test uh, individual modules. So it I mean you could try to come up with some sort of some structure of your let's say packages in your in your monolith and then try just to bootstrap those. But um, up until today, there's no no really no support for that f coming from Spring Boot uh, in the first place. I've seen people uh, doing a bit of stuff with explicit module-specific Spring configuration, like structuring their configuration and then um, actually um, using that. But it's kind of I mean it, it requires additional effort, right? So testing an individual module is uh, yeah not that easy. For microservices, the idea, as I said, is um, we have uh, the bounded context boundaries defining the deployment unit boundaries, and um, the uh, the like they they are um, basically split up and, and deployed as separate processes. So the overall system consists of several of several system. So the first well downside upside is that the bounded context interaction is remote, which means that. I mean, it has a lot of like practical consequences in production because we, we need to actually call other systems and we need to deploy some mechanisms that uh, that basically guard the calls from just failing because the other system is unavailable, is slow, or the network's not available. If you're interested in a more detailed discussion with that, uh, I had a deep dive session on Tuesday that like spends three hours discussing the, the differences a bit more. Um, Regarding the testing thing uh, or the testing aspect, um, testing individual modules become is is fine, or because by definition you just have a, a, a singular project for the module and you can just like bootstrap that, 
and uh, because that's that's an, an entire application actually. But if you have a lot of interaction with other systems or other services around it, you need to bootstrap those, right? So you need to uh, just have at least mocks or stops for the other systems that you interact with, and um, that sort of like complicates the picture, especially by uh, like slowing down the tests because like all of a sudden the the tests that have been uh, um, like or a test that just tries to uh, test the interaction between two modules has to bootstrap the other thing and then bootstrap the the application. So it's it's a bit more uh, more machinery going on here because we just like we lift up the interaction to the to the integration level, the process integration level. Something that's also gone unfortunately is that transactionality that 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 you that might be going on. Uh, easily, so you can't just like roll back uh, the um, if you if you invoke functionality in another service, then you sort of have to clean that up afterwards because um, uh, you can't just roll back the transaction because it just lives in a, in a separate process. Um, yeah, something that's also in here, or just just in contrast to the monolithic approach, it's it's harder to uh, refactor the bounded uh, the bounded context because usually the C the services are. Uh, catered around the uh, teams, so that's a different team that you have to talk to. You have to version or you have to change the APIs actually and move stuff over. So that's a bit more complicated. And it's also harder to test the overall system. And it's kind of um, the, the one reason I get or, he, or I hear, get to hear quite often is that we build microservices because testing, uh, testing. In general, is easier, right? If I just want, if I want a new feature, ship and deploy a new feature, then I just need to run the tests of that single thing. Yeah, what tells you that this new feature doesn't actually break anything in other in other uh, s services that might just make up the overall system? So there's kind of like it's it's a bit of a a fallacy, I think. Um, and of course, testing the individual system might become easier, easier in terms of like easier to execute actually. But um, yeah, the, the overall uh, testing scenario is still even becoming a bit more complicated, I'd argue. So if we, dis let's say we decide to stay rather monolithic because I'm, uh, that's the, the topic of the talk here. Um, a very fundamental question is, how do I not end up with a big ball of mod monolith or how do I actually preserve the structure of an of an application and um, one reason that I, I see those or, or monoliths degrade to a uh, to a big ball of mod mostly is that it's very easy to uh, create uh, connections between the modules uh, and that's actually partly um, Due to uh, due to just like framework features like dependency injection, right? Let's say you have like two different parts of code in in your software system: a Spring component here and a Spring component there. And there's absolutely no problem to just go ahead and in that that one component go ahead and say add auto wired some other piece of code, some Spring Bean from some other part of the code base, and just inject that. You can just you can just get access to that, right? Um, and that makes it easy to, I mean, it's kind of neat if you, if that's the right thing to do, but it's also uh, a bit um, risky because those, those connections get created without like architects noticing. I mean, there's like code reviews maybe, but still, right? So the, the, the fundamental idea is like, there's two things in the first place. One is that um, for each bounded context, I actually want to limit the, um, the uh, interaction with other bounded contexts. And what do I mean with that? Um, I have an example brought with me that's uh, actually a, a piece of code that we will have some code samples or yeah, later on. That's coming from a project I'm doing with the uh, University of Dresden. Um, they have third semester students uh, after half a semester of Java build web applications with Spring Boot. You can imagine what kind of fun that is. Um, but it's it's really interesting to see what they struggle with, and we've like prepared a bit of of code um, to to actually yeah ease the pain not the pain for them but yeah they just like get get uh, overwhelmed with 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 new technology. So what what they're dealing with is basically some kind of e-commerce system that has uh, products, that has an inventory, that has orders around the products. Uh, there's some accountancy that basically keeps track of like all the 
all the revenue made by uh, by these orders placed and uh, a couple of user accounts and business time. And the relationships here is like the dotted lines are entity relationships. So we have basically the order belonging or has a reference to the user that created it. And we have a spring component dependencies uh, that are the, the solid lines basically. And there is a use case uh, in there that um, the requires the interaction of both the inventory and the order system, which is that for every order placed, the inventory has to be updated, right? So if I order three TVs, the inventory then has to be updated to like reduce the number of uh, TVs available. And that, in this case, as you see, already uh, constitutes a um, uh, bidirectional relationships so or cyclic relationships. So what does that look like in the in the example? So there's some some transactional method complete order, and there's like an order safe in there, and then it says inventory update stock for order, and that update stock for order has an entity relationship in this case to uh, to the order, and then iterates over the line items or what have you. And so what does that mean? So if I if I if there were means to bootstrap parts of that system, then if we want to bootstrap the orders system, uh, let me take a step back, uh, this inventory is of course a spring compon a component, that's not on, I should have put it, this on the slide here, but there's some like auto-wired uh, inventory and then you just use that component here. That means if I wanted to go ahead, oh this way, um, if I wanted to go ahead and um, bootstrap maybe assuming just the order system, that would fail because that we need that instance of the inventory actually around, right? So actually just, I, I, we get into a second how we, how we can actually achieve that, but the first thing that you might wanna try is rather than writing code in a way that it actively invokes that, uh, that other component, rather switch to an event-based model that would just like publish an, an event saying, oh, the order was created, and then the inventory listening to that, because that allows you to just bootstrap the order system, right? And then just test and verify that that event is created, and then have a separate test in the inventory uh, that's basically asserting that when the order, uh, when that event is basically has been published, um, that then the inventory is basically getting updated. So you, you basically take the things more apart by introducing uh, the usage of events. So as, as I said, uh, there's, an, there's a direct method invocation here, and um, that's basically the thing that's problematic, right? In terms of, it's causing the, the cyclic relationship, that's one problem, we wanna get rid of that. And the other thing is we actually might wanna limit the, the interaction um, of, of the orders uh, module to, to with the inventory. Um, and we can do that, as I said, by just like introducing the usage of um, application events, and uh, that basically allows us to, to, um, to, uh, to change that, or that's the, we get rid of the, of the, um, the um, what is it, the component dependency. Uh, let me show you how that actually works. Um, we have this here, uh, let me just go over here and say order manager, da, 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 sales point framework. Uh, that's a that's open source, oh, it's persistent order manager, sorry about that. Uh, that's um, open source code. If you Google for GitHub, TU Dresden, I put the link into, into, the, into the slide notes. Um, uh, open uh, sales point, TU Dresden and uh, GitHub, then you'll, you'll find the repo. It's all in there. So what it, actually that code, of course, already is written in a way where is complete order. There we go. So what it basically does is it calls that, um, that order complete method and order complete is using a um, spring data feature. In this case, that is uh, just registering the event it's, you say that this is an, the aggregate, the aggregate root, it's a JPA entity in this case, there's no, whoa, 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 uh, scroll up. There you go, uh, it's a, yeah, yeah. my gosh, there, entity. Um, and the method actually, um, it changes the status, it publishes the, uh, the event by just, reg or it registers the event that has happened in the domain, and then when uh, the save method of the, of the of the on the Spring Data repository is invoked, then that event is published, and there is an 
let me, I don't, I'm not sure I know um, about the name entirely. So science point framework. There we go. There is a, on the inventory side of things, inventory order event listener that then just says order event listener on order completed event and it then just executes the uh, the verification. So it's basically verifying, do we still have, in, for each line item, do we have enough of the uh, uh, enough stock basically for for that and uh, creates an order completion report if if anything if anything fails right so that basically allows us to in this class here reduce the number of dependencies that we have to inject here and that's kind of a helpful thing to do in the first place because oftentimes I see classes or spring components that have like 15 other classes injected and become some kind of like god classes within the application and it's kind of hard to untangle them or even just bootstrap them in isolation because they just need in like too many other components so striving for that kind of model especially when you uh, when you find yourself okay this is like a code I call from another bounded context from another module then um, have a look at whether you can actually ex change that with with um, with the event-based model. All right. So the other thing we want to do is um, we want to by some means define the structure that we're sort of expecting. And defining the structure can be something that is um, that we, that we have to do explicitly, but it could also be, let's say, based on a convention, right? And um, and then we can sort of monitor or we can use that, that structural information to find out about what we actually have to bootstrap if we, let's say, say we want to test a single module in isolation, right? And we can also use it to Im impose certain rules on, the, on, those, on those module relationships and then actually uh, go ahead and try to um, find out about um, the violations of of that, that structural definition. And that can be done through different approaches, I mean, in general, and um, different, um, just in, in the first place, different ways how we set up our monolithic project to work. One possibility is that we just define a singular artifact. So we have one, one project that's exactly the thing that you've just seen in the, in the, um, in the university project. If I went or had went ahead to to uh, to, uh, to structure or to create multiple artifacts multiple maven modules or jar files for each module i basically end up with like three or four classes in every jar and like eight seven or eight jars to make up the overall system which is kind of like putting the the um or throwing the internal structure into the client's faces right so the the, the client uh, code's faces so it's 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 basically okay you want to use that thing, but I don't care how it how it's how it's structured internally. So that's why I just keep it in in a uh, in a monolithic uh, monolithic project, and um, I'd like to keep the structure in there, right? So what what we what we use here, and what's pretty pretty helpful in the first place, is that we when we say uh, we have a package per module, right? So for for each a logical module we have a top level package well top level not top level package but first level package top level is usually the the project right where you have your at or your spring boot application or your class with at spring boot application in and then underneath that we have top level projects if you if you remember uh where are we here so it basically looks just like this uh whoa. Right? You see you had there's a package for orders, there's a package for payment. Uh, ignore the sample internal for now. Uh, there's a user account package, a bit of web stuff, and uh, yeah, the, you can see the web stuff probably belongs to the user account package, but uh, that's a pretty pretty structure, pretty easy convention to keep some structure around in the first place. So um, it's easy to refactor, as I already said. We can just like move code around because we have our IDE uh, and can just like use our refactoring tools. Still, we if we if we bootstrap the if, if we want to run a Spring Boot test, we bootstrap everything. I get to to some optimizations that we that Boot already allows you to do in the in a second, and whenever 
we want to ha have more than a single package making up the module, that's kind of um, like breaking the means of control. That, that single package per module is kind of neat because, and that's what you actually can see here, we can make use of um, the package scope. Right, so we can actually charge line identifier, uh, order line identifier, and even the persistent order manager. So the implementation of the main service component is package private. So uh, why is that important? I mentioned that oftentimes the uh, the problem of um, or the, the the reason that these big balls of mud actually start to um, start to grow is that people can just auto wire things from left and right, right. And if if I'm able to hide certain components. Um, there should be a what, 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 order repository. Yeah, the order repository, for example, is package protected as well. So nobody, by definition, by the virtue of the compiler, is able to refer to that from somewhere else, right? And that's kind of important if you have critical, uh, critical functionality implemented in the services on top of the repository, because then nobody can bypass that thing by just auto wiring a repository, creating the instance, and just persisting it, right? Imagine. Uh, the user accounts need to be uh, have their passwords encoded and whatnot. I don't want to expose the user account repository to any other package, um, and I can actually achieve that by by just doing that. It's like pretty simple and straightforward, and uh, it doesn't actually need any other kind of tooling really. Uh, but however, if I um, if I go um, uh, expand on that and want to uh, basically structure my module internally, I need to create other packages which then means I need to make uh, uh, types public in these other packages, and then that sort of breaks that, that mechanism. Um, there's also, of course, a way of using multiple artifacts. I can just like build multiple Maven modules, which means I get dedicated control over, um, over the dependencies in my build file, right? Um, however, the test scope, again, then is defined by the artifact if I want to, if I can, test the module in isolation because I just have that project here and uh, can run this fine. Um, however, like testing modules in combination then requires other modules that sort of assemble them. It's kind of like, yeah, weird. However, uh, also uh, we sort of make the internal structure of the project sort of obvious to the outside because it has now all these all these jars in the Maven repository, what have you. So that's the that's the thing here. Right? And oh yeah, uh, as I said, f even for that simple project we have here, I would end up with eight or ten artifacts. Um, kind of weird. There is another thing that uh, people uh, usually or consider to actually implement this this kind of stuff. Uh, the Java module system, if you're on um, Java 9 or better, uh, or newer. And there's a, I have a bit of a torn relationship to it because you can, like, if you look at it and try to implement that kind of thing for, uh, to use it to implement, like, application level uh, modules, then you really f start to feel that it was designed to actually break the JDK apart. And that's, it's actually doing a tremendous, tremendously um, good job at that. However, there are certain assumptions baked into that that make it sort of hard to use it for, for application level module semantics. So there's a very strong uh, assumption, well, there's not a strong assumption, it is assumed that uh, like a module is a jar file, right? Which basically forces you to go with the multi-artifact uh, multi, uh, multi strategy, which I, for the, in this case, exactly didn't want. Um, and it um, it also and the, the the semantics of the open keyword. So if you're not into the JPMS, uh, opens is uh, basically enabling uh, reflection frameworks to uh, invoke classes or, or instantiate access classes reflectively, fields of those classes reflectively. In other words, if you want to instantiate a package protected class, it has to be in an, in a package that is that is explicitly opened, right? Um, that leads to weird, or it creates weird incentives to create packages where all the code goes that actually needs to be re needs reflective access. That's kind of weird. It's not something that you'd actually want to structure your packages around. And most of all, there's no real test support in terms of like, okay, here's. Big, I mean, that sort of uh, comes from the first point that we that you can't really assemble a set of packages to run tests again. So I mean, it, you still have to do that just the same way in as you have this in this uh, multiple artifacts kind of approach. 
Final one, and then we get to the to the um, to the uh, code part, is that you could use external tools to validate the structure, right? Like things like JQ Assistant and Sonograph. Uh, they usually um, they have not only access to the to the code or to the to the classes that you bas basically make up your system of. Uh, however, I mean they can they can you in inspect Git his uh, Git the Git commit history to actually take into account maybe which tests to run or what have you. So it's it's really uh, the most extensive op extensive option that you that you get. However. There's some kind of, as I phrase, distance to the development workflow. Ideally, I mean, they usually integrate it in the in the build that's executed either in, the, in your terminal or in CI. But most of the time that I spend, I do in just inside my IDE, editing code, running tests, right? And this is kind. I mean, that's kind of like creates this kind of uh, or this. There's no way I can actually, or there's hardly a way to actually run these more extensive tools in a single unit test or sing a simple integration test. Uh, there, are, there is ways to do that, but um, it's getting a bit. It's it's a bit, get, getting a bit more complicated. So, what am I here to? Or what what is the 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 idea that we basically or that I had with the with uh, working with Spring Boot applications quite a bit? Uh, it's a project that's called that for now called Modulus for the lack of a better name. Uh, available in my GitHub account and binaries available from uh, sp from our Spring IO um, Maven or Artifactory. Um, the idea is the following, or something that I, the, the design constraints for that thing was. I want to be able, like, I want to have a Spring Boot application or take a Spring Boot application and not or only change very tiny things about it. I don't want to, like, want you to use or to have to define any kind of structural information. I maybe I want to follow that that package convention, but I don't want to make any assumptions about the artifact structure. You should still be free to choose the single jar project thing uh, structure or approach if you want. You could go ahead and create 15 Maven modules. Fine. I don't, what 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 I'm what I'm interested in is the class path and the structure of the packages uh, of your code that you that you uh, that you have, right? And then based on that, I'd like to actually um, apply my sort of convention onto it. Maybe give you some means to explicitly configure stuff if you want to derive or, or deviate from that uh, convention. But then actually allow you to bootstrap what I call an individual module. I want to allow you to bootstrap a module plus its direct dependencies, or I want to allow you to just uh, run uh, in a subtree of your entire application. Right? And that's kind of like the the idea. So what is what is it fundamentally built around it? It's uh, we map have a convention to map these contexts, uh, the bounded contexts to packages. And then we have it's it's a tiny extension to Spring Boot to actually tell Spring Boot run mod this module, right? So what does that what does that actually look like? Um, there is if you if you like consider like sort of the architecture of an application to be split up into web and uh, the web layer, the business logic and data access layer, um, and on the vertical uh, size uh, vertical side of things, the different modules, right? So each module sort of has some presentation, some business logic, some data access. There already has been Spring Boot support to test layers of your application. They call that slice testing, like horizontal slice testing. So for, let's say, if you annot annotate your test class with add data JPA test, then we will only bootstrap the repositories. Uh, if you annotate your uh, test with add web MVC test, then we will only bootstrap the web stuff, and there's like mocks created for the for the repositories in the system. So I was kind of wondering if that's possible. Um, should that shouldn't that actually also be possible for the horizontal kind of thing? And it it ha it it's not like out of the box without actually defining some means to derive the structure, like what makes up a module in the first place. And this is where that that first point actually comes in. Nicely, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, there's a slide missing actually. So, what I want to show you is basically, uh, well, well, let's go ahead and uh, skip a slide for a second, a couple of slides, and uh, where are we? Uh, 
that's weird. Oh no, there it is. Um, so the idea is that you you indicate that you want to follow those package conventions by using a replacement for add Spring Boot application. It's actually meta annotated with add Spring Boot application. So if you you can just change that annotation, and nothing will actually change in terms of like your production execution. It will just be an add Spring Boot application. All the configuration will be st still be considered and what have you. However, what that does or what that enables uh, me to do is to provide you with an add module test annotation. Uh, that will make use or will analyze your packages and basically apply that convention and then find out about which packages actually to include in the component scanning, in the entity scanning and what have you, uh, and also analyze the structure of the modules and then sort of bootstrap only the parts that, that make up that particular module. Um, to show you that, uh, where is inventory module tests? So, that that system has this kind of like central Spring Boot application class, and it's annotated with add modulith, and that's why I can in the package in the in inventory package you see here, um, I can just have that test class saying add module test. Um, there's a there's additional attributes where you can find the module to be bootstrapped explicitly, but by default, just like add Spring Boot test automatically detects the Spring Boot application annotation, and um, this one then still goes ahead and knows knows about, oh, I'm in the inventory package, so that's why I bootstrap the inventory uh, module. And what I do here is I basically request a component that's part of that module, and then I write a test that asserts on a uh, component from another module, from the order manager, from the order module, and that's not being available, right? I'm, I'm expecting a no such bean definition, and if I just run this, I can, um, should get a green bar in the first place, yay, we're done. And what it does, I mean, I've, I've um, it's, it's logging stuff on, on info mode here, it basically, um, Boot or tells you what it actually bootstraps. So it says bootstrap inventory uh, in mode standalone. We get going to get into other mod, uh, modes in a second. Um, it tells you like, okay, there's a logical name for the module. There's a base package. Uh, it we we basically we analyze the structure of the Spring components. So for every Spring component found in that module, we uh, look into the, or analyze its constructors, and by that find out what module dependencies it actually has. Uh, you see there's like, uh, which Spring Beans are defined by, uh, by that module, and uh, there's also some means that's probably a bit of advanced stuff. We uh, we bootstrap some shared modules. That uh, That's some, some feature in there that you can actually define shared modules that might contain code that needs to be bootstrapped to uh, to uh, integrate with like third parties. In this case, it's there's some JPA uh, attribute converters for uh, money types in there that I need to to actually bootstrap JPA. And then it actually ends up telling you that it um, reconfigures the auto configuration and entity, entity scan packages to the packages listed. And then it just like bootstrap the same thing and just lets boot do its thing, right? So that's kind of um, neat. So what we what we sort of did was. Um, uh, we, uh, yeah. So coming from this, we were ba basically able to test that module in isolation, right? So we can just run that that thing that usually ends up in the test running a bit faster because we don't like have to bootstrap Hibernate for uh, for with with fifteen or twenty entities, but only two or three or what have you. And the interesting bit starts when we look at um, we've seen that. Uh, there's other bootstrap modes. I told you there's the standalone mode. There's an, another one that uh, bootstraps the um, the direct uh, dependencies and uh, one that bootstraps all dependencies, like the entire subtree, as mentioned. So what I want to like show you next is what happens if you try to run the orders module in isolation that actually has a dependency on something we call business time. That's just a, a spring bean that exposes the current time of the system to uh, yeah to other parts of the system. There's some kind of time shifting feature in the application. I don't want to go into the details. Just for you to, it's just important to remember. Okay, there's a dependency into something that is not included in the standalone bootstrap, right? So if we go ahead and uh, try that for the order module test, 
uh, we basically do the same, right? So we just keep the module tests around. Um, let me um, ex ex comment that out. We 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 run it. We will run into two different errors here. Um, let's see which one is the first one. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So no such bean definition. Uh, business time, right? So the the bootstrap of the context here actually fails because we want to run the orders module in isolation, and it needs a component from a different module, and um, that's not available. So there's two there's two ways that you can actually get out of the situation. You can use just the uh, Spring Boot at mock bean feature um, to define that component, and I think that's kind of neat because you sort of immediately see, okay, for that module to run, that other component is necessary. So we sort of have a way to describe the, uh, the um, required dependencies of that module by, by that. And, and this should probably still fail because otherwise the, uh, let me rerun this. Um, it should fail with a different exception, however. Yeah, there it is. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. It says, um, yeah, user account is not, um, uh, is not known to JPA because now the uh, the the still the scanning scope is, is limited to the order package which you I think see from uh, here. Let me maximize this. Oh Jesus, that wasn't maximizing. It's already been maximized. Uh, well, there we go. Uh, right. So it says the anti scanning order core and support, um, and there's some spring beads in there. Uh, direct module dependencies time. You see that it's like actually we, we found out that we that we have a dependency to to the business time to the business time module. Um, that uh, that user account dependency is coming from the fact that our order aggregate references a user account directly, and that's something that it's also nice to see that this is sort of getting like obvious now, right? So we have a dependency to an aggregate that lives in another module, and that's something worth investigating. So you could actually change that kind, that structure to rather just keep the user account ID in here to avoid that um, aggregate reference into another module, or as I'm going to do, or to fix that right now, um, we just have, we are able to uh, define extra includes. So we can, in this case, I think we have to uh, because I uh, went to with with simple IDs that should that should work now. <clears throat> See that's green now. Okay, All right. We can still check. Okay, the inventory has not been bootstrapped, but we include the user account uh, module with that test, and then uh, basically things start to work again. Um, yep. So final thing. Seven minutes left. Um, Multi-module bootstrap. That's what you've seen. I also, I mean, that's kind of like okay, we we're able to bootstrap parts of the the uh, the application. We can bootstrap individual modules or subsets of it. What we haven't seen so far is anything that's kind of like imposing structure or verifying structure. Um, for the next uh, couple of slides, I'm using those kind of badges there in the on the left. So everything green is something that's allowed, and everything red is something that's forbidden. Um, and I there's some indication on who is actually forbidding what, right? So this one zero, uh, zero one uh, thing is, that's some rejection you get by the compiler, and uh, that M on top of it is basically that the infrastructure that, that we built here that would help you forbidding or uh, some, some relationship that the compiler might actually have to allow. So with that uh, simple package structure, as I mentioned before, it's pretty. There's a pretty easy model, right? So I can use the package scope to go ahead and um, hide a component from uh, exter external access. So I can have an interface that's maybe public, and an implementation uh, that is package protected, so that uh, the compiler can actually allow me the reference from another component implementation to actually point to that interface, right? That's pretty straightforward. There's nothing nothing fancy here. And the compiler can even help me to prevent that, or it not can, it does actively, uh, to help me prevent that dependency on, on component A implementation, just by the fact of using visibility modifiers. So, so far, so simple, so easy. However, and that's kind of neat because for, in my case, that was just enough, right? However, what ha what happens if, let's say, we want to structure the module internally, we want to create sub-packages, then we actually 
or the, the compiler doesn't actually have a chance to help us with that. Why is that? Uh, the reason is let's keep the module B around and let's say we want to structure um, our module A into that, that main package and the sub packages. Uh, we can still hide our component A implementation in that sub package because it just needs to be or can be package protected. Nobody's referring to it. But, um, and we can actually still get the same verification rules um, driven by the compiler. However, if there's some supporting component in there, that support A interface needs to be public, right? Because um, component A implementation wants to refer to that. And that actually means that uh, the compiler will have, will also allow this to, uh, for usage to, to, uh, to other components, right? Because the compiler doesn't actually know about our module convention in this case. Um, in fact, um, with the modulist stuff in place, you can actually get the infrastructure to, uh, to disallow that or to throw an exception. And the reason for that is yet another convention uh, that basically only the top level module package is allowed to contain components to be referred to by other components. Of course, again, that's tweakable, but that's a pretty, uh, pretty easy convention because it effectively means that everything that is supposed to be referred to by other modules needs to go in that other package. Everything that's in sub packages is just allowed to be used by, uh, by um, the thing internally. So four minutes left. We have. Um, a couple of uh, violations that I uh, want, just want to show you being detected. Um, the first thing is uh, we check for, uh, where is my cursor? There we go. Oh, where is? Uh, the first thing is uh, some component. We check for um, cyclic dependencies between, between modules. Um, the inventory has a dependency on order, and if I place an order, uh, a, a component into order, that's actually referring back to the inventory, and then I rerun um, the order, um, the order test. It basically fails with exactly that exception, saying, "Okay, slice inventory depends on where is it? Slice inventory depends on slice order depends on slice inventory." So no cyclic dependencies on the module level. That's just verified, and it was pretty quick. Evie. Uh, it doesn't actually even start anything boot before that because uh, we can we can just find out about that. Let me re remove that problem. Um, modules violation detection internal components module cycles oh internal components was see that um, that package that I have here that's actually using uh, the uh, or it, it creates an internal component right something that's supposed to be hidden not being not uh, allowed to be accessed by uh, by anyone else and I actually create a component that tries to make use of that so it's reaching out to sample internal internal component and if I run the test again it's just as quick and tells me that uh, module order depends on non-exposed type of sample internal yada 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 through its constructor what have you right so it's th just basically there's a zero definition kind of visibility uh, rules um, uh, yeah constraint checker that's kind of the that's kind of the idea um, one other thing, and just to, uh, there's one more thing that's uh, quite kind of interesting is uh, that we can also, of course, use that um, that information to derive some documentation from it. Um, there is some component saying, in this case here, the documenter. Uh, and if you run this, if you run this code, it, it can you can do that in a test or uh, just have a. Uh, an additional main method. Um, yada yada. I need to undo that. The, the issue that I created. Uh, where was that? Right. Remove that again, because otherwise the tests won't work. That's kind of cool, right? Um, <coughs> that should do the trick. Um, and then we end up with a file that's actually planned UML. Where is that source? Test. No, not resources. Uh, a target. Generated docs, modulists, components UML, and if I then switch to the plant UML view, you get um, a bit of an overview about the the component dependency. So it's not like it's not like listing or writing out the uh, individual classes and the dependencies, but the components derived from that from that uh, uh, that 
module, uh, module model, basically. Um, I'm, there's still like two things in there. It's like the listens to, depends on, and uses relationships. Uh, I have a ticket open to actually untangle that a bit to have separate diagrams for, for each uh, relationships. And it's, you probably want to remove the core one, then it would probably get a bit more, um, bit more uh, readable, actually. All right, that's been it. Um, there is the the project is available in my pro local GitHub. Just search for Modulith. Uh, there is a couple of resources uh, that you might want to check out. Axel's talk on the majestic modular monolith. Uh, Simon Brown has a lot of uh, good content on on that topic. And um, yeah, the the refactoring to system of systems talk yesterday had a lot of info in on that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, have fun at the conference and um, see you around. <laughs>